In this lecture, we'll discuss emergent behavior, and we'll discuss detecting emergent behavior in the context of proxy gaming. An example of emergent behavior is a performance spike. It's difficult to make models safe if we don't know what their capabilities are. If the capability can potentially spike and activate or turn on suddenly, then it's a lot harder to make those models safe. For example, let's say we have a programming bot, but then there's a performance spike that makes it know how to go on the internet and hack. That would obviously be a problem. It'd be a lot more difficult to make programming bots safe if we don't know fully what it's capable of or if its capability can suddenly change. Unfortunately, some models have capabilities that are hard to predict. For example, this adversarial MNIST model has its accuracy greatly increase as the capacity of the model increased. It didn't increase steadily, it basically suddenly turned on. So this is an example of a performance spike. and We'd like to be able to anticipate these. Some capabilities can be highly unanticipated. Some qualitatively distinct capabilities sometimes spontaneously emerge, even when we don't explicitly train the models to have these capabilities. So for example, GPT-3 was trained on a large text corpus and it was trained to predict the next word. However, as the model got larger, it suddenly became able to perform three-digit addition. Nobody trained it to perform three-digit addition. All it did was predict the next token in its pre-training corpus, but it picked up the ability. There wasn't a specific three-digit addition task while it was training. Likewise, with multi massive multitask language understanding, that was a data set with many different multiple choice questions, probing knowledge and law and economics and history and so on. We can see that as the models got larger, the accuracy suddenly started to increase. Likewise with program synthesis, models were far better to able to output code as the models got larger. So we can see that as the number of parameters increases, sometimes unanticipated capabilities just sometimes spontaneously emerge. Sometimes interpretable internal computation can emerge. Some self-supervised vision transformers such as Dino learn to use self-attention to segment images, even without explicit segmentation supervision. To see this, let's look at some saliency maps. The saliency maps are obtained by thresholding the self-attention maps to keep 60% of the probability mass. So the supervised models, self-attention maps are as follows. And we can see when we look at the elephant that it's not actually segmenting the elephant. Meanwhile, Dino, which is learning through self-supervised learning and not learning with the segmentation loss, ended up learning to segment the image. So it's not just external behavior that we want to detect the emergence of. We also want to detect internal emergent behavior. Another example of emergent behavior is grokking. Grokking happens not with the model scale increasing, but instead if the number of optimization steps increases substantially. So we can see that in this task, the train accuracy gets to the ceiling before a thousand steps. Meanwhile, the validation accuracy at that time is still at the floor. In fact, it takes a few more orders of magnitude before the capability lifts off and suddenly emerges. This shows that if a model isn't exhibiting a property, that doesn't mean it's within its capacity. Perhaps one just needed to train a few more orders of magnitude before it would emerge. Sometimes emergent behavior arises from emergent goals. An example of an emergent goal is self-preservation. Self-preservation can improve an agent's ability to accomplish its goals. So self-preservation emerges in many adaptive systems, including AI systems, but also in biological systems or companies. An example is an agent that's instructed to serve something simple like coffee would have incentives not to be shut off. If it was shut off, it could not serve coffee. Therefore, it has an instrumental goal to preserve itself. This is why it's said that self-preservation is instrumentally useful for many goals, because for a goal, it's often the case that preserving oneself will make one better able to accomplish that goal. As a bit of additional vocabulary, when a goal is sufficiently useful that it's likely to occur, 
or be a goal of various sufficiently advanced agents, then that goal is called instrumentally convergent. For example, pursuing power, cognitive enhancement, and acquiring resources may be instrumentally convergent for advanced agents, including advanced AI systems. Emergent behavior is an emerging research area, so there's room for future research. Consequently, future work could develop a benchmark to detect qualitatively distinct emergent behavior. Other work could develop tools to better foresee unexpected jumps in capabilities. Work could also develop infrastructure to improve the rate at which researchers can discover these hidden capabilities, assuming that they're interacting with these models. Also, they could create diverse testbeds with many not yet demonstrated capabilities and screen new models to see if they possess them. So perhaps no model is able to perform some specific task, but we can create some test beds with these different tasks and fine tune the models and see if it's within their capacity to suddenly now solve them. That way we're more proactively seeing what their capabilities are rather than continuing to scale them up and then finding out what they can possibly do. Now let's speak about proxy gaming and emergent proxy gaming behavior. To understand proxy gaming, let's first look at a concrete example. In this boat racing game, an RL agent gained a high score not by finishing the race, but by going in the wrong direction, catching fire, and colliding into other boats. Proxy gaming occurs when a misspecified proxy function is over-optimized. So in this case, the proxy score was being increased by the model doing a lot of turbo boosts, while it should have been going around the track. Instead, it just kept racking up points by getting a lot of turbo boosts. So this is an example of a proxy is being misspecified and it being gamed by a reinforcement learning agent. Here's a classic example of proxy gaming. In a region, there were too many snakes, so people wanted to decrease the population. Therefore, a bounty was created. Surely this would incentivize people to go out and kill snakes. But what actually happened is that people started engaging in cobra farming by raising many snakes, killing them, and then turning them in for the cash reward. When people found this out, they stopped the bounty program and people then released the snakes from their cobra farms. Consequently, this good intention ultimately backfired. With the previous example, the objective was to reduce the cobra population. The proxy was a reward or bounty or incentive for each dead cobra. And the gaming strategy was to raise cobras and kill them to receive a bounty. Here's another proxy gaming example. Let's say the objective is to increase website user satisfaction. The proxy could be the number of clicks, but there's a gaming strategy. One could promote clickbait or addict users. That would increase the number of clicks without actually working in favor of the objective. That wouldn't necessarily increase website user satisfaction. Here's another example. Employers might want to select smart, conscientious students, so they could use a proxy, such as GPA. But there's a gaming strategy. One could take easy classes, and that could increase one's GPA. This is a fairly deep phenomenon. If one tries to intervene in an adaptive system, the system will act as though it's trying to resist its own proper function, and often intervention efforts will backfire. Many systems will kick back and override and be adversarial to interventions. Even a simple system such as a thermodynamic system can exhibit this type of property. Recall Le Chatelier's principle. If an equilibrium is disturbed by changing the system's conditions, then there'll be an effort to counteract the change to reestablish an equilibrium. So there's an equilibrial readjustment. Consequently, it's not necessarily even alive systems that will oppose their own function or oppose interventions. As another example, complex systems can have positive feedback loops or self-reinforcing loops for the status quo. And for interventions for the system, they're often negative feedback loops. Consequently, if one tries to intervene in the system, one may face the negative feedback loop and have one's intervention be wiped away or counteracted.
Likewise, if a system has a controller that helps it maintain homeostasis, then the controller will work against interventions that can upset the equilibrium or homeostasis. Now let's turn to Goodhart's law. It states that any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it. And by statistical regularity, we mean a heuristic or a feature such as GPA. Now, Goodhart's law is itself a rule of thumb or heuristic. It isn't an actual ironclad law like a law of physics or anything like that. So while it has the name, it's just an observation that often is so. A popular but extremely simplistic account of Goodhart's law is when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. This overly simplified account of Goodhart's law has led to substantial confusion. First, this oversimplification can lead one to turn against measurement. Often, one of the first tasks in understanding scientific phenomena is to measure it. But this suggests that the measurement will cease to be a good measure if people start having an interest in it or try and improve it. Therefore, all measures become defective measures, so don't even bother measuring. That's wrong and makes the perfect become the enemy of the good. Nearly all measurements have some imperfections, but despite that, some are useful. This oversimplification of Goodhart's law has also led to self-defeating arguments. For example, if somebody proposes a new measure or goal for an AI system that will make it safer, someone who's keenly aware of Goodhart's law could fire back and say, well, Goodhart's law says that it will become a target, but then it will cease to be a good measure. And therefore, this isn't actually useful. So for all possible goals, we can say Goodhart's law, and then we can say, therefore, there's no good goal. By believing there are no goals you can give AI systems, there's basically no way moving forward. Unless one recognized that this is actually an oversimplification of Goodhart's law, which itself is a rule of thumb and not ironclad. People day to day constantly pursue goals. And some schools of thought believe that there are goals worth pursuing, such as people who are concerned about existential risk. They may be concerned about reducing the probability of extinction. They think that is a good goal. Ideal utilitarians believe that maximizing goodness is what one ought to do. So that's their goal. Some goals are good to pursue, and some goals are more robust to optimization pressure than others. For example, GDP is a proxy for national wealth, and many countries continue per to pursue GDP. Countries are very powerful optimizers and have been optimizing this goal for a very long time. Nonetheless, it still is a useful proxy. Now, in the future, perhaps it may not be as useful under extreme automation or lots of changes in the environment, and then it will need to be adapted. However, it's been substantially more robust to optimization pressure than other things, such as a person's GPA or a worker's performance review, and as a proxy for employee quality. That's much easier to game. So one thing that this Goodhart's Law formulation doesn't get at is that some objectives are more robust to optimization pressure than others, and we should be particularly interested in proxies that are more robust. So there's a continuum. The earlier formulation suggests that, well, it all ceases to be a good measure. It's a binary property. Once it's a target, it's automatically bad. That's not so. Some are more robust to optimization pressure than others. What are some of the factors that make proxies less robust to optimization pressure? Well, one would be limited oversight. So if I have limited spatial oversight, then there's less of the picture that I can see. I can only see a portion of it. I'm not seeing what's going on in a different location, but that might be quite relevant. In the case of temporally limited oversight, perhaps I only have a small amount of time with the thing I'm trying to measure. So let's say there's an interview process. If I have a fairly short time span with them, perhaps it'll be easier to game compared to if I had more time with them. Their computational costs. Perhaps I'm using a neural network to approximate a proxy, but I can't use that large of a network. I have to use something that's a few orders of magnitude smaller than what would be ideal because of real world considerations. Computational costs can give rise to objective approximation errors. There are also just general measurement errors that can make proxies 
less robust and less able to track the correct objective. There are also evaluation costs. Potentially, it's very difficult to evaluate the quality of a solution. It might require implementation and testing to see actually how well it works. That might be far too slow. So consequently, if I have some budget constraints, I may have a worse approximation. Another factor that can reduce robustness would be a lack of adaptivity or robustness to distribution shift in adversaries. So if the objective is a moving target, then that makes it harder to gain. Meanwhile, if the objective is a sitting duck, adversaries can more easily gain that objective. There are also issues like there might be a lack of foresight about the ontology or about the correct structure of a proxy. Here's an example of a proxy with an incorrect structure. Let's assume we're trying to track human happiness. Then let's say we're tracking it with the proxy of dopamine. Well, dopamine is just structurally wrong. It's an anticipation chemical. So we're measuring the wrong thing. Finally, proxies may not include everything that the person cares about. A person may think that there are various intrinsic goods, such as pleasurable experiences, or knowledge, or beauty, or raising children, or the exercise of reason, or pursuing one's projects. If the proxy isn't including that, then one might expect an approximation error. Since deficient proxies are ubiquitous, optimization algorithms should be created to account for the fact that the proxy isn't perfect. Additionally, we should find ways to make proxies more robust. These are some ways of counteracting issues with proxy gaming. Another way to reduce risks from proxy gaming is detecting when it's happening. Fortunately, there's a benchmark designed to help us detect when proxy gaming is happening. It's got a few different tasks. It's got traffic control, glucose monitoring, and COVID response. In this lecture, we'll just speak about the traffic control task. Here's a schematic of the traffic control environment. First, there's a misspecification. The true reward is minimize mean compute time, but the proxy reward will be to maximize the mean velocity. There will be stronger optimizers. The optimizers could be stronger by an increase in parameter count or more training step slash compute allocated toward the models. The models could also have more actions available to them or a more fine-grained resolution in the action space. And then finally, this can result in proxy gaming. There, there can be a low mean velocity for some models and a low mean commute time, but for some other models, the more powerful optimizers, that can result in a higher mean velocity and a higher mean commute time. Let's look at the result of traffic control. Remember that the proxy was to maximize mean velocity. So both the networks were optimizing this objective, but it obviously gave rise to some different results. The more capable model maximized the mean velocity better than the smaller model. However, that resulted in undesirable traffic behavior such that the mean commute time wasn't as minimal. This figure shows that there's emergent proxy gaming in this environment. As the model gets more powerful, as it gets more parameters, we can see that the proxy reward continues to go up. However, the true reward is highest for the smallest models, and the true reward decreases sharply at a small region in the space. There's some emergent behavior going on. So we can see that more powerful optimizers don't necessarily result in better results because they might exploit issues in the proxy. How can we detect emergent proxy gaming? Well, one could use policies as detectors. So if we proceed with the assumption that there's no true reward, but we have access to a trusted policy, then we can potentially perform proxy gaming detection. The idea is to compare the two proxies and measure a distance between them. Let's look at the proxy gaming anomaly detection results. There's a description of the environment at the left, followed by a hyphen, and then the type of misspecification. So there's the traffic merge environment, and the type of misspecification is misweighting. If we look at the area to the rock curves, we can see that we often can get above random chance, that is 50%, and sometimes fairly high, like 80%. 
the mean Jensen Shannon, mean Hellinger, and range Hellinger are different types of distances between the current proxy and the trusted proxy. So we're computing distances between them and performing anomaly detection on that basis. It works somewhat well, but there's still certainly room for improvement, even for simple tasks such as this.